we haven't had this many people together in a room since before lockdown. So we've completely forgotten what we're doing. We all feel like we want to stand outside and not look at you and look at you on a screen because we've just been used to seeing on a screen. So we're a little bit terrified. So bear with us. <laughs> and for some of us, it's the first time that we're training kind of face to face like this. So um, we, we've got a variety of topics today. Um, sorry, I'm Sue Farmer. I'm from the MCN Dolls team in Dorset. So Dorset are hosting. Um, one or two of the things that we say are, are kind of, I guess, individual to Dorset, but not all of them. We'll make it clear when we are. I'm, I'm, I'm going off piste a bit at the end of the, uh, the morning. Um, so in terms of the morning, there's teas and coffees up there. We'll have a break sort of midday so you can, or mid-morning so you can have a drink. Um, we are recording this rather terrifyingly. Um, so we're not live streaming, but we're practicing for conference. So next year we'd like to do a hybrid conference. So this is a practice event. So um, that's why we're filming it. Um, and it will be available to those people who don't, um, aren't able to come along. Obviously, we know you need to keep your mobile phones on. Some of you will be on duty, but if you could just step, step outside to take calls, not expecting fire alarms. So um, I actually don't know where the muster point is, but I would imagine we just leg it out of the doors. Just don't get burnt. Obviously, it's a non-smoking building. We'll have a break. Ask questions as we go along. Um, I know there's a lot of us in the room, but we'll try and keep this as informal as possible. Um, and we will ask you for feedback at the end. We've completely forgotten things like signing in sheets. We're just not used to this. So we will ask you to just, we'll send a bit of paper around just so we can make a record of who's here. Um, but we would really value your feedback as well. So the format of the day, um, Nat Natalie Wakefield's gonna talk about no refusals because I don't know about in BCP, but in Dorset that's caused us some confusion. So we're gonna have a little look at that. Um, Tilly's going to do a case law update. Rachel's going to look at some top tips for form completion. Um, you all do it brilliantly, but we could all do it better. So just some thoughts on that. I've got the easy gig. I'm doing an LPS update. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> then we can all go home. So, so yeah, thank you very much for coming to say, enjoy yourselves. Enjoy meeting with people in the flesh. Please don't catch COVID. And I will hand you over to Nat. Hi, everybody. This is the first time that I've done training live. So bear with me because I'm trying to like look at notes and use the clicker and talk into a microphone. It feels very weird. <laughs> there we go. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about um, no refusals. Um, so the definition of um, no refusals is up there. It's from the Code of Practice. Um, so the purpose of the no refusals is to establish whether an authorization to deprive the relevant person of their liberty would conflict with other existing authority, uh, authority for decision for that person. So I'm going to break that statement down in a couple of slides time. But first of all, I just wanted to show you this. Um, so hopefully you will recognize this part of the assessment. So it comes after the capacity assessment and before the best interest section um, on your form threes. Um, I think that this part of the assessment is actually quite fluid. Um, I think you can only really answer it once you've done the consultation because what this is asking you is whether the person themselves has written an advanced decision to refuse medical treatment or whether there is a decision by an LPA or deputy um, and whether both of those conflict with an element of the Dole's assessment that you're doing. So you can only really know the answer to that once you've spoken to everybody that's involved in, in the person's life. Um, what this section is in is a tick box for whether there is an LPA for health and welfare. It's you have to delve a little bit deeper. You've got to ask the questions about whether they agree to all the elements um, of the care and treatment. Bear with me. <laughs> um, 
And one element that I thought um, would be quite helpful to talk about in regards to this is, um, is also about the language that we use when we're asking the questions of the LPAs or the deputies for health and welfare. Because I think very often we can get really caught up in the language that we use as professionals. Like we, we do this all the time. We understand what we mean when we are talking. But actually the people that we are talking to, they, they don't live in our world and we, we need to remember to step into theirs actually. So when we're talking about no refusals to LPAs and deputies, we need to be using the language that they understand. So talking to them, you know, really basically about the care and treatment that the person is, is getting and, and do they agree to all elements of that? Do they understand what we mean by restrictions that are placed and, and really highlighting what those restrictions are because sometimes they might not even be aware that, you know, there are pressure mats in place or door sensors. And do, do they know that the person is being stopped from going out into the garden when they want? Do they know that safe holds are being used? So, so sometimes I think we need to be quite explicit about what's happening, um, you know, to, to the people that, that they love and they care about. Um, the Open Justice actually um, put a really lovely article out um, very recently that was written by a family member. So they were an, they are an LPA for health and welfare um, for somebody um, who was subject to a doll's assessment and then it went through the court of protection. So they've written an article about what that whole process was like from their point of view. Um, and so I think I have put a link to that article at the end of my slide. So, you know, read it, get a better understanding as to what it is like from those family members' points of view. And if, you know, um, you've got family members who maybe don't quite understand the doll's process or are feeling a bit apprehensive about it, send that article to them because it was written by somebody that is experiencing it in the same way that they are. And it might, it might just help them feel a bit more comfortable with the process. So I'll go back to the definition um, from the code of practice. So I just wanted to highlight here when they're talking about authorisation, um, that is um, the current DOLS assessment that you are doing. The relevant person is the person that you are there to do the assessment with. And this part about existing authority for decision is what I'm going to look into a bit more detail with you. So there are two um, existing authority for decision for that person. Um, so the first one is that, they're, um, that the relevant person themselves has made an advanced decision. And I will go through a little bit about what an advanced decision is in a couple of slides time. Um, the second one is a valid decision um, of a donee or deputy. So a donee is an LPA for health and welfare and a deputy is a court appointed deputy for health and welfare. So, advanced decisions. So this is um, paragraph 19 from Schedule A1 of the MCA. So there is a refusal if these conditions are met. So A, the relevant person has made an advanced decision. B, the advanced decision is valid. And <coughs> C, the advanced decision is applicable to some or all of the relevant treatment. So there is a whole there is a whole chapter about advanced decisions um, in the code, and we don't have time to go through all of that today. So this is kind of like your whistle stop tour to advanced decisions. But what I will say is that if you if you come across an advanced decision, then have a look in the code, but also come to us and, and we can talk through it all together. Just have a look to see, you know, whether it is whether it is a valid advanced decision and whether it is applicable to some or all of the relevant treatment. Bear with, sorry. So I'm gonna have a look at an example. There we go. Okay, so this is Callum and he has made an advanced decision which states that I refuse the use of medication where its purpose is to sedate me, causing a reduction in my movements and time awake due to a care home being unable to manage my needs. 
all other forms of support must be explored before sedative medication is deemed in my best interest. Therapeutic intervention must be explored as the less restrictive option and moving me to another care home should also be explored. So what you find out whilst doing your um, assessment is that Callum has a covert medication plan in place for the administration of diazepam. Um, and that's because he walks um, with purpose most of the day and night. He can be physically aggressive towards <laughs> staff um, when they try and support him. He becomes tearful often. Um, and Callum started to decline um, his medication. Um, so a mental capacity assessment and best interest decision was made between the care home, pharmacist, GP and Callum's son that, um, that he would be given the diazepam covertly. And what you find during your background information um, gathering is that Callum has worked in had, had worked in psychiatric services for most of his adult life. Um, and he was actually involved in research projects which, which were concerned with the over-sedating of older adults with dementia. So his advanced decisions actually got quite a lot of context and meaning to, to him. So my question goes out to all of you is that you know, through your consultation, you find out that he has made this advanced decision. You know that there is a best interest decision for him to have sedative medication. So what, what are your thoughts? What do you kind of think next steps might be? Is there anybody out there? <laughs> yeah, great. Yep. Yeah, because I think, you know, what, what Callum is saying here in his advanced decision is that, you know, there, there, there may possibly be scope for him to have the sedative medication, but, but what he wants is to make sure that everything has been tried beforehand for him, that that really is a last resort. So exploring, like you said, whether other alternatives have actually been tried. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. To look at the type of care home that's in, if it's a really small environment, that might not be best. So you could zoom in and yeah. have a look at the care home that's got wider corridors, a bit more of a loop so you can walk around mm -hmm. rather than just the end of the small kind of care home shop. Yeah. Any other thoughts? That's fine. Yeah, go for it. Basically, their, their Jewish background hadn't been taken into consideration. Right. But I believe when they came into the, the discussion about removing him, it was actually felt that he, wanted, he was quite happy where he was. He got to know people and he wanted to be with people. So it was an interesting case where they thought about the advanced decision was actually challenging what the person was maybe not, there was a lack of capacity, but his presentation was that he was happy. Yeah. He was content. And it's that, that sort of dilemma. Maybe not, not just taking an advanced decision verbatim, but mm -hmm. seeing through the change. And I think, I think at the NCA conference, I can't remember which group it was, but yeah. we were talking about how, how she's got quite specific advanced ideas about what she wants, but realised that it would conflict with also a wish not to put pressure on family and things. So didn't want to go into care, didn't want to make medication, but actually the priority of also had the vision she didn't want to be a burden on family so presenting sort of conflicts yeah absolutely um it was val um that did about um advanced decisions <laughs> um but yeah you're right mark and, and and val did talk about it at conference that actually you know people write advanced decisions um but also people do change throughout their lifetime so it 
This may have been written 20 years ago. Maybe Callan's views have changed since then. Um, and I think that goes back to having a look to see, um, you know, what whether his actions or anything that he has said since then um, may conflict um, with what he has written in his advance decision. What we also need to be doing in situations like this is actually going back to the decision makers. You know, did did the care home, the pharmacist, the GP and Callum Sun know of this advance decision when they decided it was in his best interest to give him covert diazepam? Because if they didn't, then they, they need to consider that advanced decision. Um, and if they, do, if, if they do think that that advanced decision is valid and it is very clearly relevant and applicable to the treatment that he's getting at the moment, if they still feel like that is in his best interest, um, then what we need to be doing is, um, is really talking to, you know, talk to us, talk to our legal team, you know, is, is this something that, that we need to be approaching the court of protection about? Because it is an advanced decision that he has written. Um, and if it's relevant and it's applicable and it's valid and, and a best interest decision has been made, that he should still have the sedative medication. If, if, if we feel like that is going against it, then, then we need to have some further oversight um, in regards to that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Thank you. <laughs> what it will mean, um, I will say, is that there will be a period of time where um, Callum is unlawfully deprived of his liberty because what we can't do is authorise the doles if there is, um, it, it, if we can't um, complete that no refusals element. So, again... MCA team need to know about it, we need to speak to legal about it because there will be that period of time whereby, you know, the professionals, the decision makers in regards to that COVID medication plan need to do their work in regards to whether that is still in his best interest in light of the advance decision. But we can't move forward if we don't have that no refusals element. The bit you don't know is whether his decision will be different if you do yeah. No, exactly. And and I think that's something that, you know, they're conversations that um, you know, as professionals and with family members, you know, we, we need to be having, we need to better understand um, you know, the context of the advanced decision. Um part of me wonders that because Callum has worked in psychiatric services, he may have seen a lot of that and kind of thought that people jump to medication rather than exploring more therapeutic options first of all is that what he's getting at here he wants to make sure that we really are looking at the less restrictive options first of all but what I wanted to highlight is that we need to be having those conversations with people um, because you know that advanced decision is, is is really important we need to know about it particularly because he's got a covert medication plan in place yeah Um, honestly, I haven't come across it. I don't know if anybody else in the team has, but I really, I, I don't think that advanced decisions um, are that common. It's not something that we come across too often. Yeah, and, and, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure that they are. I, I don't really think that there's that much kind of, um, that there's that much knowledge out there in the general public about advanced decisions, how to write them, how to make sure that they are, you know, valid, really. Yeah, Shirley. The DNARs, yeah. It's more common if someone would have told their family member they were going to have a return in. Don't you dare, like my dad did, don't you dare put me in a home, <laughs> that sort of thing. But then I would know that that was, but it wouldn't be a formal advance decision. No, so that wouldn't be a form, that wouldn't be an that advance be decision. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, so there, there is a difference between an advanced decision and, you know, previously stated wishes and feelings. Um, there, there, is, there is a difference. But, uh, Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we'll move on to the second authority for decision making, and that is a valid decision by a donee or deputy. So Schedule A1 of the Mental Capacity Act, paragraph 20, says there is a refusal if it would be in conflict with a valid decision of a donee or deputy for the relevant person to be accommodated in the relevant hospital or care home for the purpose of receiving some or all of the relevant care or treatment. A, in circumstances which amount to a deprivation of a de amount to deprivation of the person's liberty, or B at all. I don't know about any of you, but I really struggled to like make sense of that statement in my head. So I have this one instead, which is from the Code of Practice, which actually makes make a lot more sense in my brain. <laughs> um, so if any part of the proposal to deprive someone of their liberty including any element of the care plan, would be in conflict with a valid decision of a donee or a deputy made within the scope of their authority, then the standard authorisation cannot be given. So that statement makes a lot more sense to me than, than the previous slide. So I just thought I'd put that up there because I thought, well, if I don't understand it, there probably might be a few people in the room that don't really, <laughs> that don't really understand that more kind of like legal jargon. So I will move on to an example. So Zara is the LPA for health and welfare for her father, Hazim. Hazim is currently being deprived of his liberty in DCH for treatment purposes, and Hazim lacks capacity to consent to this. So Zara refuses that it is in her father's best interest to be deprived of his liberty at DCH on the basis that her father has always said that he will only accept treatment at PGH or RBH. Zara explains that Hazim's child died in DCH and places blame on the hospital. He has never been back to DCH for treatment. Zara says that it would be in her father's best interest to be deprived of his liberty in PGH or RBH, but cannot agree to it at DCH. And that is within the scope of, of her decision making. What she isn't doing is refusing the dolls. But what she is doing is saying that it is not in her father's best interest to be deprived of his liberty at DCH. He, he needs to be moved because if he had the mental capacity to make that decision, he never would have gone into DCH in the first place. At that point of transfer, he would have been like, absolutely not. You will not take me to DCH. You must take me to one of the other hospitals within the county. So we've had a few examples recently of LPAs for health and welfare saying, no, I refuse for the Dole's assessment to go ahead. And that's not what the no refusals is about. Um, and this is going back to, to that idea of using the appropriate language when we're talking to LPAs and deputies. This isn't, they, they don't have the authority to refuse a Dole's. They do have the authority in situations like this to say, no, I don't think it's in the best interest for them to be deprived of their liberty there, but they should be somewhere else because of this. You know, there's, there's context there. There is reason behind it. She's advocating for what she knows her father would have said if he had capacity to make the decision himself. So they don't have the 
authority to refuse a dole. We know LPAs don't have the authority to deprive somebody of their liberty. So it makes sense then that it follows through that they don't have the authority to refuse a dole. It's, it's about whether there is conflict with their with decisions that they think would be in the person's best interest. You know, we you may find that, I'll just give another example, that actually an LPA thinks that, um, you know, the person should be allowed to walk to the shops by themselves from the care home, but actually the care home is stopping them from doing that. You know, that that is a restriction that's been put in place that the LPA is in conflict with. They actually think that they're, that this person would be safe leaving the care home, walking to the shops and coming back. So we need to be asking those really explicit questions, making them aware of all the restrictions that are in place. Do they agree with them? And if they don't, then it's about exploring that. Because if they are refusing some elements of the care and treatment, then that no refusals element isn't met and we can't progress with the dolls. So just a few key points. Um, like I've said, you know, always ask those involved in P's life whether they know of an advanced decision. If there is one, you need to see it. Always ask the LPA or deputy for health and welfare whether they have any objections to the restrictions in place. Do they agree that the care plan is necessary, proportionate in the person's best interest? And as always, give us a ring and have a chat with us if you've got any concerns, um, you know, about no refusals or any element of the assessment. You know, we're always around um, to have a chat with. And that link there um, is for the article that I spoke about in the beginning that was written by the family member. That's all from me. Thanks very much, everybody. Oh, that would make sense. Turn it on. <laughs> Thank you, Nat. That was really, really interesting. Um, we've had quite a few cases um, in Dorset where no refusals have been an issue. Um, and as Nat says, you can't, we're not asking for consent to do the doles assessment. We're asking about the deprivations. So I'm going to talk to you today about case law and policy update. Now, I could talk to you all day about this. Um, so I will try and restrict what I say to half an hour, maybe 45 minutes. I don't know. You might just have to stop me. <laughs> OK, so we've had a lot of quite significant court cases since we've last done a case law and policy update. So I've just picked out four cases today to talk to you about, um, sort of a bit more in detail. One piece of CQC guidance that we need to be aware of. And then there's three cases that I just wanted to do honourable mentions to. Um, I will just put a caveat at the start of this um, with some trigger warnings. Um, a couple of the cases talk about quite significant sexual and physical violence. And then there's also a case that talks about um, birth and um, pregnancy where things may or may not have gone wrong. I've got to stand up this way. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so please, at any time, if you need to take a break, please do um, look after yourselves. So the first case I want to talk to you about is about sex, because I thought that will get everyone's attention. Um, it's the Hull City Council BKF back last year. So a really sad case, actually. So KF is a lady with a learning disability. And she had been in a relationship with KW. It was a long-term partner. There had been a lot of domestic violence um, from him to her. There was concerns about coercion and control. And an incident happened where he had quite seriously sexually assaulted her to the point where she, was, she almost died. 
as a result of it. She was in critical care and he was charged with grievous bodily harm. So the most serious type of harm that you can cause someone. He was convicted and was due to be sentenced for this crime. And quite frankly, the judge made out, he, he didn't even know why there weren't bail conditions in place to prevent him contacting KF. But there were no bail conditions. So the decision was made by the Court of Protection or the case before the Court of Protection was, can KF have one more night with him, unsupervised? She had made it very clear that she wanted to have sex with him again. She was in love with him. And it was literally one more night because she had terminal cancer and was given a prognosis of a maximum of 18 months to live. His prison sentence was likely to be a lot longer than that. So they would never again get this opportunity to be together. Um, so the, the case had already been through court around decisions around her care and residence, but uh, um, she had been assessed as lacking capacity to consent to contact for contact arrangements with him. But because of this high stakes, one more night decision, this was not something that her care teams felt that they could make. They were right. They asked ju the judge to make this decision. So what was the actual decision that needed to be made? Because on one hand, she'd already been assessed to lack capacity around contact with him, but she had capacity to consent or to engage in sexual relations. She had had two pr children previously. She was familiar with sex. It wasn't something that was new to her. She was able to make those decisions in general, but this was a really person-specific issue because of the history between KF and KW. And the judge said, well, if you lack capacity to consent to contact with someone, how can you then have capacity to have sex with someone? Because those two things don't match logically. If you can see some, you can't see someone, yet you can have sex with them. That just doesn't, doesn't figure. Um, so he said, actually, this is a very time and person specific issue. So the relevant information that they had to unpick, the history and the na nature of the relationship with KW. So he had been physically and sexually violent towards her. And there was a reasonable foreseeable consequence that he might do this again during that night. There was a real significant risk to her. Um, now, I don't know about you, but I have certainly made some unwise romantic relationship decisions before. Um, and actually, sometimes people choose to be in a relationship with someone that's not best for them. So the judge had to be very mindful of this and that actually we can all make, as adults, we can make decisions that might not look to an outsider that they're particularly wise. But the issue with, with KF was that she wasn't retaining this information about the serious sexual assaults. And the expert that was looking into her capacity was saying, well, I don't know if that's a denial. Is that a trauma response? Is it to do with her learning disability? But she wasn't able to factor that into her decision making. And the judge said that, that capacity questions can't be made in silos. Um, it, and again, it, it wouldn't it'd be completely incoherent to say that KF didn't have capacity to decide to meet with him in a restaurant, but did have capacity to engage in sexual relations with him. Um, and there has to be a real workable plan for the carers that are looking after KF. So KF's wishes and feelings. She had said, well, I'll read it out because I think it's really powerful. I've had two children. I can have sex with KW. If that's what I want, that's what I'll do. No one can stop me. I'm sick of this. You can tell the judge that too. It's my decision. I'm being treated like a child. I can make my own decisions. I want my freedom. I can make a decision about sex. Really, really powerful statement from KF. And I think any of us to go against someone's wishes 
there's got to be a really good evidence base behind that. So the outcome, the judge ruled that it was in, um, it was KF was found to lack capacity in relation to this decision. And obviously, no one can make a best interest decision around consent to sexual relations on someone's behalf. So they, they put in a best interest decision, a care plan, so that she could have supervised contact with him in a public place. Um, they could still be fairly intimate, but not be going off anywhere in private. Um, and the approach taken here was to focus on contact first and then a person-specific take on sexual relations. So that's a little bit different from some of the case law that we've had previously. Um, we've had a case back in 2013, the TZ case, which the judge said that we have to take a forward-looking thought into can someone consent to engage in sex. Um, we might have multiple sexual partners in our lives and it'd be unrealistic and unjust to assess someone's capacity in relation to every single person that they want to be intimate with. But then equally we had the re-M case, I can never remember the letters, I remember the stories but never the letters, um, back in 2014 where someone needed it was a, a very person-specific decision. And actually, sometimes if someone's in a long-term relationship, it may be best to take a person-specific approach. It really depends on the individual. So I suppose what the judge is saying here is just look at the facts of the case. Everyone's different. Sometimes we have to take into account previous case law, but actually sometimes situations are so different that we have to make a new approach here. So that was KF. Um, the next case, uh, Lancashire and South Cumbria NHS Foundation Trust v AH. So AH sounded like she was a little bit tricky to support. Um, she's got mild learning disability, um, type 1 diabetes, and then a whole long list of suspected mental disorder diagnoses. Um, there was a strong suggestion that she might have an emotionally unstable personality disorder, emotional dysregulation, trauma, PTSD, autism, ADHD, the list went on. They weren't really sure, they hadn't specifically come up with some labels. But she'd been living on her own, in her own property, needing a package of support, which included support to manage her diabetes. Um, she was type 1 diabetes and she needed insulin and she couldn't administer that herself. So the district nurses had been trying to support her and going in every day to administer the insulin. But she made this really, really difficult for the district nurses. She would say things like, they can only come at a very specific time. They've got to ring me 30 minutes before they get here. I'm only going to accept certain district nurses. There was some allegations that she had been stalking and harassing some of the nurses involved in her care. She'd followed one nurse home um, and became quite fixated on that person. So there was a lot of the nurses that said, actually, I, I don't want to go in and, and work with AH anymore. Um, so there was also an issue that she didn't want to accept certain types of insulin um, and she was very specific that one drug company she would accept. Then they discontinued the insulin, um, so she couldn't have it. That wasn't even an option. And she blamed the district nurses for that and said, well, if I can't have that specific treatment, then I'm not going to have it at all. So she kept refusing to have the support that was being offered by the district nurses. And this resulted in her becoming so unwell that she ended up in hospital in critical care. Um, due to mismanagement of her blood sugars. So she had the relevant treatment in hospital. She was under a dose while she was in hospital. Um, then it came to her being medically safe for discharge and they were talking about discharge plans. Um, where could she go? So the MDT were really concerned that if they sent her back home, this was going to happen again. They said they could offer her 
the input from the district nurses, but she would have to accept that actually they're a really stretched service. You might not get it at the same time. You might have to accept different members of staff. You have to accept the type of insulin that the drug companies are, are doing at that particular time. And AH was adamant that she wasn't going to accept that. So the judge, it became a 21 day challenge. The judge said, right, care home is in her best interest for an interim period of assessment. Um, and that they made, although there was differing opinions about her capacity in relation to care and accommodation, the judge made an interim declaration that actually on the balance of probabilities, she did probably lack capacity. But they ordered an expert report, section 49 report. And it was done by Dr. Camden Smith. Um, she did a really comprehensive report. The judge was very um, praised Dr. Camden Smith, um, that she considered everything and looked at AH's holistic circumstances, that looked at her whole risk history and her decisions that she'd made in relation to her diabetes, her care, her home, and looked at it in a really sort of holistic and thorough way. So AH was in the care home, as we would expect, the care home submitted a Dole's Form 1 referral. So although there was already 21A proceedings, because she's in a new environment, local authority needed to do a new Dole's assessment. So they asked a BIA and mental health assessor to go out and meet with AH to authorise the deprivation of liberty in the care home. A psychiatrist went out and found that she had capacity and wrote a very short report and didn't really put much detail or give much consideration to her risk history, just looked at her, sort of took whatever she said on face value. So local authorities said, right, well, we can't grant the dolls because she's not eligible because she has capacity, yet she's objecting to being in the care home and doesn't want to be there, wants to go home, care home, like, what, what, what do you do? Bit of a pickle. Um, so the judge said, oh, hang on, I've already talked about that. Um, yeah, so the judge said, well, I'm looking at this psychiatrist's report. You're not giving me any solid evidence here that you've considered everything. Surprise, surprise. I thought this feels really familiar. Um, we've, we've just instructed an expert to do a really comprehensive capacity assessment in all of these different decisions, including care and residence. Psychiatrist hasn't even looked at that report or taken any consideration into that doctor's findings. What are you doing? Um, very, very critical of the psychiatrist and of the local authority. And the judge said, well, when you're in these situations, as BIAs and as mental health assessors, you are independent of the local authority. You can form your own opinions. That's what we want you to do. But if you're going to go against an expert report that's been prepared like a week or so earlier, you're going to have to have a really good evidence base for your opinion. We're not saying that you can't challenge them, but you're going to have to have done a really, really good capacity assessment. Oh, not question, just stretching. Okay. <laughs> <That's why. laughs> um, in this situation, the judge said, I can't tell the local authority to who to commission to do the capacity assessment, but I can give them a very strong nudge that if you've got enough evidence from an expert, get them to do the capacity assessment, or at the very least, make sure your assessors have read all the relevant reports. So quite a useful learning point there. If we've got those cases, we have, once a case is in the court of protection and we have to do a new dolls, you need to be mindful of all of that court documentation that's going on um, and be prepared to stand by. Yes. Um, 
So I suppose well you might have to consider proportionate restraint that's then authorized by the court um we know in in hospitals they use security guards quite a lot um to restrain people and actually if a judge has authorized that and said that it's necessary and proportionate and in their best interest you you can use that um Well, wow, that's a very interesting point. You're asking about the interface here. Um, come along to our training next week on the, uh, the 4th of May, I think it is. Um, Beechcroft are doing a session on interface between Mental Capacity Act and Mental Health Act. It's going to depend where the person is. If they're in a care home, then dolls, you can't, de you can't detain someone under the Mental Health Act to a care home. It's the issue when they're in an acute hospital or a community hospital. Yeah. Hold that question for next week. Sarah from Beechcroft will be, I'm sure, really happy to answer that. All right. Um, I've already talked about that. Um, right. Third case then. Um, so North Bristol NHS Foundation Trust um, versus R2023. Again, another really interesting case. I don't know about you, but I really love reading case law. Um, so R is a female serving prisoner. Um, I think she had um, sought asylum in this country. Um, not much was known about her background. She did have two previous children, both whom were no longer in her care. And she was pregnant with her third child. Don't really know how she got pregnant or the circumstances around that while she was in prison, but that they just sort of gloss over that in the judgment. So I don't know, don't ask me. Um, she was going through a really difficult pregnancy and there was a lot of complications that meant that both her life and her unborn baby's life were potentially at risk. So North Bristol did actually a really good job and they tried to support her to make this decision for herself. She wasn't didn't seem to be able to and they got it to court really quickly which is all what the judges of all in courts always say get a case into court if there's going to be complications so she was saying things she was really happy about the pregnancy she wanted the pregnancy she wanted this baby but the doctors involved in her care said that if she didn't have a cesarean at 34 weeks the baby had stopped growing inside her. Um, if she carried the pregnancy to term, it wouldn't survive and she possibly might not either. So really, really serious risk um, involved. And they said the only clinically safe option is for her to have this C-section. But she wasn't agreeing to that. She said, no, I'm, I'm going to have it to term. I'm going to give birth naturally. It's all going to be fine. And the doctor said, it's really not. You're saying that you want to have this child. We want you to have this child, but your course of action isn't going to result in the outcome that you want. R didn't have any formal diagnoses. 
There was some suggestion that she might have a learning disability, but she wasn't able to take on this information that the doctors were giving her. And they had really tried. They'd done all that principle two stuff about maximising her capacity, given her stuff an easy read, gone back through the decision multiple times, but she still wasn't agreeing. So they took the case to court. Um, and the judge said that actually, on the balance of probabilities, she does lack capacity to make this decision. He made a best interest decision that she should have the cesarean at 34 weeks. And normally we don't get to hear about the outcomes from case law because once the judgment's done, that's it. But there was a postscript at the end that said um, the C-section went ahead at 34 weeks. It was successful and mum and baby were both healthy. So I was like, oh, that's nice. We don't normally get that resolution in case law. But what I want to highlight in this case um, is it's a bit of a masterclass, really, around capacity and what to consider. So we've, we all know about the JB case from last year. This was the um, chap who they were assessing his capacity around engaging in sex that went all the way to the Supreme Court. And that's when the Supreme Court made their decision and declaration that obviously the code of practice is wrong and out of date. When we're assessing capacity, we have to identify the matter or the decision that needs to be made. We need to say what all of that relevant information is. Then we need to see whether the person can understand, retain, use and weigh that information, communicate a decision. If they can't do that, is that as a result of an impairment or disturbance to the functioning of the mind or brain. That is the, the, the stages that you go through. That's a bit jargon. Hopefully this is a bit more straightforward. What's the specific decision? What does the information, does P need to know? And if P can't understand and or retain and or use away and or communicate, then is this caused by P's mental disorder? the causative nexus test. So hopefully that's clear and um, there's been lots of cases recently that have gone through reference this JB case. Um, in this capacity assessment there was quite a lot of discussion around what the actual decision is. Um, so the original decision that the official solicitor had put forward was whether to carry the, her baby to the point of natural trial birth or to have the baby delivered earlier, and if so, whether to do so by induction or caesarean section. McDonald, Justice MacDonald said, no, that's too broad. You can't, that's not the decision because that is not going to be the foreseeable consequences of that decision. It's about whether or not to consent to the clinically indicated procedure. Um, yeah. Also made some really useful points in this judgment. I'd really go back and read this judgment if you've got time. Um, it is quite an interesting one. And it wouldn't be training without a picture of a gangrenous foot. I do apologise. But count yourself lucky that it's a drawing and not an actual photo because I very almost put the photo in, but I thought, let's not, just before coffee break, let's not. Um, specific diagnoses are not necessary. We can work on the balance of probabilities that someone has got a mental disorder. In ours case, they really didn't know what sort of disorder she had or not. Um, as diagnostics for things like learning disabilities take time. They didn't have time. They were satisfied that the evidence before them was showing there was something impaired in her decision making enough for them to clue, conclude that 51% chance that she lacked capacity. Um, he also made the point that human decision making isn't standardised and formulaic in nature. It's quite normal for us to be in denial about a decision that we don't want to make, put our heads in the sand, make a really stupid decision. That's all part of the human experience. Um, and the bar should never be set too high. Um, 
We don't need to consider every last bit of information. So R didn't need to know every detail about a cesarean section to be able to consent to it. She just needed to know the broad ins and outs about you're going to be under anaesthetic, you're going to have a knife, baby's going to come out. Um, I always liken this to the Joe Bloggs test. Um, if you pulled off a random member of the street and you asked them to talk you through a decision, that's the level of understanding that we should expect the people that we're assessing their capacity to make. So if you're making a decision about, I did one the other day about someone selling a house. I don't know all the ins and outs of conveyancy. I don't expect them to. They just need to know what the general process is. And if that's simple enough in layman's terms, that is where the bar should be set. Um, and the JB case, not to be confused with JB in the sex case, this is a different JB. This is JB lady um, with her gangrenous foot, lady with schizophrenia, um, diabetes, untreated, foot went gangrenous. And they said she didn't need to know all about the amputation, just generally, you're going to have your foot lopped off. And that's about all you need to know. Um, so the final case that we're looking at in detail, God, I'm not doing great for time, but anyway. Um, am I? Okay, good. Um, so PG, 34-year-old, um, um, diagnosed with a moderate learning disability, ASD, trauma-based mental illness, in line with EUPD traits. Getting a bit of a theme here. Um, very complex young lady. Um, she had been going out, putting herself at what professionals considered to be quite a significant risk, going out to random strangers, engaging in all sorts of behaviour um, things. And she was supported... I think it was one to one, sometimes two to one. So this case came into court because she was deprived of her liberty in her own home and a community doll needed to be put in place. Um, she was objecting and there was lots of complications. So it wasn't suitable for the streamlined procedure, the re-ex procedure. So it went through to court as an actual decision. Um, Parties agreed on some things, that she lacked capacity to litigate and enter into an occupancy agreement, but she had um, capacity to decide where to live. Then they disagreed whether she had capacity or not regarding care arrangements, contact with others during these periods of heightened anxiety. So the court was asked, do we take a longitudinal approach or an anticipatory approach to fluctuating capacity. I'll explain what that means now. So, approach one, because we've got two general approaches to when someone's capacity fluctuates. A longitudinal view is a little bit like so when someone has capacity most of the time, or but then lacks capacity some of the time. And you have to kind of take a balance and look at someone's timeline that there's more times than not when they have capacity or more times when not when they lack capacity. Um, and this was an approach that was highlighted in the PWK case, which was a chap with a learning disability where he would sometimes be accepting of the support, sometimes not. So when he was calm and things were going well, he was in agreement with having care and support. When he was upset or agitated, he then declined support and would have quite a... They, they use the word meltdown. I don't really like that term, but that's the, the, the language that was used in the case. Um, so the judge in that case took a longitudinal view and said, well, actually he was having these incidents of, of meltdowns really quite frequently. And during those times, he, he couldn't consent to the support he was receiving. So let's just take a longitudinal view and say, actually, more likely than not, he lacks capacity because he's not retaining that information and understanding that information when he's at the height of anxiety. 
Um, the judge also nodded to the CDM case, which was the diabetes case, which looked at whether someone had capacity um, when their diabetes some well diabetes management is kind of a, a whole load of macro decisions you've got to look at your lifestyle your diet medication there's all sorts of things that you need to take into account and the judge referred to that as a macro decision rather than a specific discrete micro decision of like i've got 10 pounds what am i going to spend in the shop that's a one-off decision diabetes management macro decision so that was one approach that the judge could have taken the second is the anticipatory approach set out in the DN case. Again, very similar, but where DN had these equivalent meltdowns. Again, that was the language used by the court, not my language. Um, and said that during these times of really heightened anxiety, we're going to take the approach that he lacks capacity to make decisions about his care during those times, so staff can intervene. They might need to restrain him. They might need to stop him from putting himself at risk. The rest of the time, he has capacity and can make decisions and go about his life as he likes. So which appro approach did the court take in this case? They opted to, to take approach one, so the longitudinal approach. That's not to say that the other approach was wrong and, and anticipate, I can't say it, anticipatory decisions have their time and place, but for PF, is it PF? Whatever letters it is of this person's name, PG, PG, thank you. That <laughs> um, because her behaviour was so erratic, sometimes they couldn't work out if she could make the decision or not. She might be having a really lovely day going along to the shops. She might then see some friends, so-called friends, run off out into the road and go and spend time with them. And it would be unfair on the individual care workers that were with her to be accept expected to assess her capacity to make that decision around do they stop her from running out in the road or not. Her presentation was so variable that they said, actually, in this case, a longitudinal approach where the carers could support her at all times in her best interests and then recognise that when she's calm, that they then try and maximise her decision making within that. And that was felt to be a, a, a care plan that was going to keep PG safe and would be workable for the carers. As I said, there's some honourable mention cases. The DY case, this is like quite revolutionary case around the decision, um, can you use Mental Capacity Act to prevent someone from harming someone else? But we're not going to talk about that today because that will be in our webinar in May. So come along and we will talk about that case then. Um, if any of you work in transitions, um, so the Lincolnshire County Council case, the TGA one. We know that parents can't consent to deprivation of liberty for 16 and 17 year olds. This Lincolnshire case says that when someone's under the age of 16, obviously Mental Capacity Act doesn't apply. People use Gillick competence to work out if a child can make those decisions or not. But if they lack Gillick competence, a parent can consent to a deprivation of liberty if there's no dispute that it's in that child's best interest. So if you're working with transitions cases, maybe 14 or 15 year olds who are deprived of their liberty and lack Gillick competence to consent to that, the parent can consent. Doesn't need to go to court at that stage, but when they turn 16, then we know from the D case that you do need to go to court. Um, last case, um, a bit of registered mental health nurse bashing in this case, I'm afraid, but just a cautionary tale. Um, a case was in 21A proceedings and there was a lot of disputes about restrictions involved in this case. Whilst it was in court, 
the nurse took it upon herself to change the restrictions quite significantly without consulting the MDT or notifying the court. And this was around um, permitting AB, is it AB or SB? I mean, AB, I think, um, to self-harm. Quite a, well, it's a big decision. And if it's in court, don't make your decisions on yourself. Um, it should have gone through the MDT, should have been gone through legal. So just a cautionary tale there. And finally, I just want to touch on the policy that came out by CQC around covert medications. Um, we know all about covert medications. We know the AG case that we've got to be very mindful of them when we're looking at dolls. But CQC made it really crystal clear in this guidance. It is a fundamental right to refuse medication. And I don't know about you, but if someone put something in my body that I didn't know about and I didn't agree with, that's a pretty serious issue. It should only be used as an absolute last resort. I think covert medication is still used far too widely um, when it's not actually always necessary and proportionate. So this also comes up when people are have a safe swallow plan. Perhaps they can't swallow tablets, so liquid medications prescribed, and it's put in food. And the carers are saying, well, it's not covert because we've told them about it. But have you told them about it every single time you put it in their food? Have you showed them that this is the liquid from the bottle? This is going into your yogurt and this is what I'm feeding you? Because this is the level that we should be supporting people if it is overt medication. Just making it up into a food, a yogurt or something at the nurse's station and then giving it to them, but saying, oh, well, well I've told them that they get medication. That's not good enough. That's slipping into covert medication territory. It needs to be really crystal clear that if someone is being given medication, that they know about it every single time. I think that's it from me. Um, should we have a break? How long are we doing for break? I enjoy talking about dolls. Um, so we're, today I've been asked to talk about top tips in relation to dolls, but what I want to just, just start with is let's set the context on uh, deprivation of liberty safeguard and dolls and what that means for people. And I just want to bring that back. Oh, let's not go too far to the law um, as our starting place, really. So why do we have dolls in the first place? And this is linked back to the Human Rights Act. So we've got Article 5 of the Human Rights Act, which states, everyone has the right to liberty and security of person, and no one should be deprived of his liberty, save in the following cases, and in accordance with a procedure prescribed by law. Um, and there is some different things that that bill part says, but what we're focusing on is the lawful detention of those of unsound mind. Um, and it goes on to say that everyone who is deprived of his liberty by arrest or detention shall be entitled to take proceedings by which the lawfulness of his detention shall be decided speedily by a court and his release ordered if the detention is not lawful. And I think sometimes we talk about doles and we talk about this person's on a doles, we've got this many people waiting for doles, um, you know, and I really think sometimes it's really important for us just to reflect on that person and what that means for a person that is deprived of their liberty um, and not lose that in the number of people we have or the number of people that are waiting um, and just think, how does it feel to be deprived of your liberty? Um, can we imagine um, how that would feel if you're taken and placed somewhere that you really don't want to be, you might be confused. And what we really want is somebody to listen and um, you know, give us that help if we want it. So we've got that ability to challenge that and make sure that that is the right thing that's happening for that person. So I just wanted to think about that side of things. We've got um, about Liberty um, and the Cheshire West um, Meg and Meg, Meg case. And this just thinks about what the meaning of Liberty is as, as opposed to what we're talking about, the deprivation of liberty. So 
um, obviously Lady Hale gave us this. Liberty means the state or condition of being free from external constraint. It is predominantly an objective state. It does not depend on one's dis disposition to exploit one's freedom, nor is it diminished by one's lack of capacity. So again, I'm just thinking about what liberty means for you and, and, and for that person so that we can empathise with how people feel, really. Um, so what I'm going to look at next is just a few points for dolls. Um, so obviously, as the BIA, you've got the form free. Um, we've got a new, fairly new form, isn't it? I think it was about November time last year, was it, that it came through? And that should really give you a lot of guidance on how to complete the form. So really, if you follow the format of that, you know, you can't go too wrong. And that does um, put in a lot of case law as well around what we want to think about. Um, one of the things for me that I find really helpful is the background. And that's why I've just put the background part there. What I like to see, and what, when, because obviously we read a lot of dolls, and what I like to write myself is really that personal information about that person. What's their story? what's important to them. I think we have to remember that it's relevant information, but what is important to that person? Because that can really influence how their dolls um, and their best interest decisions are made, really, and how that's put in place for that person. So I think if we can get that background and then somebody can pick that, that, that doll's form free up and read that, they can really get a sense of who that person is and what's important to them. Um, and I've just got Margot there as a little example. Um, so Margot was um, a lady that I went to see for a dolls, older lady in a care home. And I just want to talk about how that relates to dolls, really. So, um, and the background of dolls. So um, Margot um, used to work as a nighttime care assistant in a care home. Um, so one of Margot's things that she liked to do was at night, and sometimes she would get up at night as well. But before she went to bed, she would walk around the home and just check that everybody was okay, that the staff were okay, that the residents were okay. And then Margot was very settled and happy. But if somebody tried to stop Margot, that would distress her. So if someone said, Margot, what are you doing? Go back to your room. You know, you shouldn't be wandering around here. You know, then people start talking about things like, oh, Margot's challenging. And we get these terms, don't we? Margot's got challenging behaviour. Well, actually, if you know Margot and you know what's important to her, Margot's quite happy if she's wandered around, checked everyone's OK and she's settled down. So if you can just include that, you know, that sort of information, that personal information, then, then you know, that's what's important. And that's how, you know, the dolls can be really useful, really, because we know that actually Margot's fine then, you know. So it's just knowing that person, I think, is, what is, the, is the message there. Um, then I, what, what I've just put there is about routines. So um, I think that's the other thing that we can sort of try and think about and empathise with is that people, all, yeah, we all have our routines, I'm sure. Um, and again, if something changes, it can be really difficult for that person. Um, and it can be really small things. So um, I was thinking about things like, you know, do we have coffee, coffee, coffee or a cup of tea in the morning? If somebody just comes along, gives you a cup of tea, you'll be like, oh, well, normally I have coffee. And it's just these little things. And, um, you know, I saw a man the other day and um, he was like, oh, can you tell me the football results? Um, so I was like, oh, I'll look it up on my phone because I don't know. But I was like, oh, have you not been able to watch it? And he's like, no. But again, that was important to him. And, um, and then I was like thinking about this a bit more. And then I was thinking, and this is why I've got my cup here. Um, and it's just a small thing. But, I mean, how many people have a favourite cup at home? And I started asking some of my family about this. I was like, do you have a favourite mug that you use? And they're like, yeah, I do, actually, I do. And then I was thinking, yeah, I'm not just, like, thinking this. And it seems a small thing, but all these things that change in someone's life can be really challenging for them and can be really difficult. And is there any way that we can make a difference um, to those people? And I can appreciate, like, some of this will be dependent on the care home or the hospital that they're in and trying to work with them. And but I think that as a BIA, we have, you know, a role to try and help that. Um, so can we sort of, again, go back to that background information? Can we find that out? Can we talk to the home about it? Can we ensure it's documented? 
you know, sometimes you will go into a care home and you say life story and the page will be blank. And I just think, oh, that's really sad because what is someone's story? Everyone's got a story. Um, so can we work with the home? Can we, can we work with relatives to bring in some of those personal things? Maybe their favorite cup, maybe their person, you know, somebody that likes books. They might have some books next to their bed. You know, anything that's personal to them, it can just help people feel a bit more comfortable as well is what I'm trying to say is the message, really. And what can we do to make that difference? And so how can we do that? Um, so I know that like person-centered is one of those sort of words, but that's what I think is really important. And what I think, as um, which is nice about dolls and being a best interest assessor, because you do have that opportunity to really think about that and uh, really find out what makes a difference for people. So, what have I got next? So, oh, right, I'm going to talk about us. So, around tips um, was one of the things that we were thinking about today. Is um, so, what I was going to just talk about is a little bit about assessing capacity. And um, what I've got this from is um, some of you probably know the case of DB versus Hillingdon. Um, and let me just get my. Uh, to hold it. So this is in relation to a 72-year-old man living in a care home, diagnosis of organic personality disorder, associated catatonic disorder, secondary to stroke. Um, the London Borough of Hillingdon granted a standard authorization to deprive him of his liberty at the care home. Um, a capacity assessment concluded that DP lacks capacity to decide on whether to live in the care home. Um, and he was able to understand and retain it, but was unable to use or weigh the information. So, um, but this case law really brings, the Hillingdon case law, which I will put the link up for in a moment, um, really looked at what went wrong with that capacity assessment as well and what we can learn from it. So the capacity assessment did not consider whether DP was able to contemplate any other available options regarding his care and residence. Um, and his wishes were actually to move to another care home close to his friend. So an application under section 21A of the MCA was made um, by his legal representative to challenge the standard authorization. Um, and this went to court and the first judge said that there was su su sufficient, sorry to say that word, to make an inter interim declaration under section 48 of the Mental Capacity Act that he lacked capacity, um, and, but did not address the issue of whether the standard authorization should be ended. So an ap application was made on behalf of DB then for permission to appeal the decision, um, and this was heard by Justice Hayden. Um, and the few points from Justice Hayden that said, and then I'll come on to the key points for assessing capacity, were around he found that the capacity assessment was insufficient as the assessor did not explain the purpose of the assessment, did not discuss P's wishes to move residents and gave unclear reasons for reaching his conclusion. So permission to appeal was granted and on the grounds of the first judge wrongly approached the questions of whether to make a declaration of incapacity as a best interest decision. But what came out of this case is Justice Hayden described Section 48 and Section 21 in detail and highlighted the purpose of a Section 21A application is to either vary or discharge the deprivation of liberty authorization. So I'm just going to highlight a few points that came out of key points for practice here, which was So the purpose of the Mental Capacity Act assessment needs to be explained to the person and this explanation should be documented in the assessment. So I think it's just when we go and see people, we need to be really honest with them about what we're doing and that we're not there for a chat. We're actually there to assess their capacity um, and it's just being that transparent with them and explaining it. If P is not informed about what you're assessing, this could gravely undermine the reliability of any conclusion you come to. So again, in your dolls, just document that. I explained to P that I was there assessing their capacity 
in relation to the decision around accommodation, care and treatment. We need to be clear about the decision that we're assessing P's capacity for and ensure that the assessment clearly de demonstrates and documents the relevant information given to P, the questions asked and the person's responses received. So some of you probably already do this, but it's really helpful in a capacity assessment. And if that case was to go to court, it's something that they ask for, is what was that discussion? How have you documented it? What have you asked? And so it can, it's really helpful to put that and then put what the other person's response was. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and that was DP versus LB Hillingdon 2020. So if you do want to look that up, um, that's the link or the reference there for that one. Um, the other thing I was just going to touch on was objections. Dull's objections. Um, Again, it's really one of those things that we really want to identify if someone's objecting. And it can be you're a BIA, you're a social worker, you're a nurse, you're AT going in there into a home and you see something, you know, please let us know because we really want to know who those people are that are objecting. Um, obviously, we try to find out as much as we can, but sometimes we don't always know. Um, some of the case law there, which we have now got on the form, so I'm, I'm not going to go through it in detail, but we've got our um, RD and others, which gives you that list of how to check that if someone is objecting. And some people will use that in their dolls form, especially if they're a bit unsure. It's a really helpful tool to sort of go through and have a look. And, and this comes out of AJ. I think a lot of us know about AJ and, uh, you know, what went wrong there, really, um, with her objecting and, and the RPR role. Um, and things like that. Um, and this is something that comes up sometimes, I think. Um, the second part, which I've put here, and I've taken this from the Co Dole's Code of Practice, as that's what we've got to work, for, work with at the moment, haven't we? Um, and I think sometimes people get a little bit confused about objections, and is it, isn't it because of how that person's presenting or what they might be saying? And so I think this is just a helpful reminder that assessors should, assessors should always bear in mind that their job is simply to establish whether the, whether the person objects to treatment or to being in hospital and whether that objection is reasonable or not is not the issue. So it's not for us to determine whether that's a reasonable objection or not. It's, it's for us to highlight that actually that person is objecting. And I just think that's another helpful sort of reminder, really, when we're thinking about people that are objecting. So now we've got Dole's top tips. Um, what I've done here is I've asked all the team for their top tips. What I'm going to do, I'm just going to take a couple minutes, because um, I think we've got a bit of time, haven't we, Sue? Got a couple of minutes. Um, just, just on your tables or as you are chatting, if you could just think of anything that you would say is a doll's top tip, and then I'm going to give you um, what the MCA team have said. And I have asked their permission, so yeah, but you'll see that in a moment. So if you just take a few minutes um, to think about it, and if anyone wants to let me know what their top tips are, anything you think you can share with other people, then yeah, let us know.
Okay, we're going to need to call you back together now. That's okay, sorry. I know we can talk about this for a long time. If we could, if we could come back together now, that would be great. Is everyone ready? We're going to crack on. We're going to have to stop your conversation. Sorry. You can carry on afterwards if you want to. <laughs> right. I, I'm just going to see. Does anyone who's uh, had this discussion, would anyone like to volunteer to say some of their tips that can be helpful for other people? Rose, hi. Okay, yeah. 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 I think that's really helpful. I don't know if everyone heard that, but it's about visual aids. And uh, particularly where you find those cases, can't you, where the person can't communicate um, and how we can find ways around that. And that really goes back to the Mental Capacity Act and the, the, you know, taking all practicable steps, doesn't it? Is there any way that someone can indicate how they're feeling? So that's a really helpful point, I think. Thank you for that. Over there. Yeah. 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 And again, that goes back, doesn't it, to what's important to that person or who is important to them. And, and it's like you say, we can't, we might not be able to change the fact that a doll needs to be in place, but how can we make that best for that person? What can we do? Um, and it might be someone that they particularly want contact with. It might be something else in their life that's really helpful for them. Um, and it's just that background again that we know, isn't it, that could be helpful or we can try and find out. Yeah, thank you for that. Anyone else got anything particular they want to uh, mention? No? Over this table? <laughs> Proportionality, yeah. Yeah. I think that's the other thing to mention, isn't it, with dolls is it is really, like I say, I really want to know, you know, and I guess that's part of our, our work is, is what, what someone's story is. But it's also what is relevant to the dolls. So we don't want to write loads of information or loads of personal information that's not actually relevant to that person. Um, so it is that balance of trying to get what's what's right there, isn't it, really? So, yeah, thank you. OK, right. I'm going to go on to... Um, tips from the team now. Um, so we're going to start off with um, top tips from the MCA team. So starting off with our admin team, um, we've got a brilliant admin team, I think, in the uh, MCA team, um, really helpful to us. Um, and so I wanted them to um, be able to tell us what would be helpful from their point of view as well, really, and what we can do to help. Because we get a lot of dolls forms come free, and we want to make that process as, as streamlined as we can as well for everyone involved. So one of the things the admin team said, could you put the mosaic number at the top of the form? It just helps with identifying that person. Um, double check that the address is given for people consulted is correct. Also correct on my uh, mosaic for those DCBIAs. Um, so the admin team send out all the forms, so it's really important that we have the correct address for those people because obviously this is confidential information. So people do move, don't they? So we want to make sure that we've got that because we're sending out people's documents and things, so we need to make sure that that information is correct. Um, sometimes people are a bit unsure, I think, about which forms people get. So everyone consulted gets the Form 5, unless they've got a last and pair of attorney for health and welfare, and then they get all of the forms. So 
because they need that information because they are representing that person. But generally, it's the Form 5. Again, checking about the last and power of attorney forms. Have we got a copy of them? Have the care home got a copy of them? Can we request to see them? We might need to do an OPG check um, because, again, you know, that is a responsible role and we want to make sure that, um, you know, we've got that documentation and that is in place. And it is for health and welfare because, as we know, some people do have finances and they don't always have um, health and welfare. Please remember to sign the form, especially if we do not hold a copy of your signature. So just another thing there, if you can do that. Um, this, that sort of thing, it just stops us having to come back to you as well and delay the process because if we haven't got some of those information, sometimes we, we have to come back to BIAs and say, can you sign the form? Can you add this? Um, and obviously that's delaying that dolls for that person being put in place. So what have we got next? Oh, this is Caroline. Where's Caroline? Oh, there you are, Caroline. Caroline gave some really helpful tips, I think. You've got a whole slide of your own, Caroline. <laughs> so, um, Caroline's put, get a good understanding of the situation before visiting. This may include consulting with any allocated workers to ensure the assessor can adhere to the principle two of the MCA. This involves considering if the individual may respond best if a family member is present. Be clear about any possible options that may be considered through ongoing work to ensure an appropriate conversation when asserting the person's views. A little bit similar to what you were saying over there, really, isn't it, about the person and do they want someone else involved, so. Um, have a knowledge of which boxes on the form do not highlight spelling errors. <laughs> we've tried to fix this a lot, haven't we? I don't know if we've still fixed it, have we? Or <laughs> we've tried to, we've tried to. So do check that. Using the read aloud option just ahead of submitting the report will help to ensure that the report reads well. That's a good one, isn't it? Because sometimes when you read, look at something yourself, you can't see it, can you? And if you listen to it back, you can actually. <laughs> um, I've seen people doing this. I haven't tried this one myself, but use, you can use dictate to record your word assessment. Although I find this can require you to speak quite slowly and does not always translate what is said accurately. So if you're using that, you've just got to proofread it, I guess. But I'm all for anything that can help us a bit and save a bit of time if it works. Use fellow BIAs as well as advisors as sounding boards to reflect on the assessment to assist you to draw as your conclusion. Sometimes I think people just find it helpful to talk it through with someone else. You sometimes know the answer, but sometimes it's just having that chat through with someone can really help, I think. Um, and then if the case suggests the possibility of an objection that may be raised to the court protection, detail the mental capacity assessment if it's given to the BIA in detail, as this could avoid the need for a Section 49 capacity assessment being requested. So this is from Caroline. And I think, again, it is that sort of, we don't want to have to repeat things if we can for us and for the person, because they have to go through lots of assessments as it is. Um, and if we can get that right from the start, then, you know, that's the, the quality that will be required from, from the Court of Protection. All right, let's go on. Who else have we got? Got Jane here. So make sure that you get a sense of the person, who they are, what they like and what is important to them. This is really what I was saying, Jane, is, you know, you know what we've said, I don't want to repeat it again, but it is about who that person is. Um, Tilly's but you're not writing a Care Act assessment, so you don't need to go into great detail about care needs. Your focus needs to be on whether the restrictions that amount to a deprivation of liberty are necessary and proportionate to the risks. So again, about that relevant information there, isn't it really? I think Tilly, yeah, that's what you're trying to say. Yeah. 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 An overview, yeah. So it's just going back to that, thinking about what your what, what needs to go into that assessment. If you're bored writing it, then we're bored reading it. <laughs> we do have to read all of your forms, so you know, just to say, you know, if you can make them as succinct as possible and what's relevant, it is helpful for us. Um, Tilly and Val both like this one, didn't you? So I put you together on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. What's relevant? Yeah. 
Um, check the spellings of names. I think we're coming on to you now, Val, aren't we? This was yours, if you remember. Check the spellings of names of people you consult when you speak to them. Try not to use acronyms. People don't always know what they mean. And don't say passed away or even passed when you mean died. Sadly passed. Val likes, you know, things to be very direct. But that is from your background of working in learning disabilities, isn't it? And actually, if you use vague communication, people don't always respond to that or know what that what you're trying to say. So it's about putting it, it isn't, I think, Val, is what you're trying to say there. <laughs> Um, Natalie, if you doc in document name, so there's a list, isn't there, on the form of, of things that you've looked at. You don't have to list every aspect of the care home file that you've looked at. You can summarise them by writing care home plan, social care records, daily care notes. Again, thinking about what is relevant to the dolls. A continence care plan is unlikely to be relevant to the dolls assessment, but a safe holds care plan would be. So document that you looked at that. It's all helpful because this is, we don't want to write loads of information that we don't have to, do we? So, you know, you can summarise some of that, those sort of things. Read what you're being asked to write. Oh, this is Sue now, isn't it, Sue? I'm going to come on to you, Sue, now, and I'm going to finish with yours because we've got another nice one to come at the end, don't we? So, read what you're being asked to write. Only answer the question you are being asked to answer and don't go off piste. Please remember that if the person, that the person, if they can, and their family may read your report. So, we don't care if they had an affair with a vicar, robbed a bank or took drugs with Elvis or had a love child with their best friend's husband. It's unlikely to be relevant to their deprivation of liberty and in their best interests. So, I finished that. That was Sue's comments. <laughs> and I did ask everyone. Everyone was happy for it to be put in. So, that's, that's the end of it. Um, thank you very much for listening to that. I'll hand you over to Sue. Thank you, Rachel. And can I just thank all of the team? Because apart from me, nobody's done face-to-face -face training ever. We've all done it remotely since they've been in the team. So it's really very different having a sea of faces in front of you. Um, so as I say, I've got the easy gig. I'm going to talk about LPS. So what no LPS? <laughs> oh, yeah. I was hoping not. <laughs> Apparently the camera adds 10 pounds. I think it's going to add about 50 for me. Right, so no, no LPS. So we now know that we're not going to see LPS beyond the life of this parliament. So we know that we're going to go to a general election. It'll be sometimes towards the end of this year or next? Next year, yeah. So we've, we've got at least a couple of years that we're not going to have LPS. There's a lot of thought in the system that will never see it. It will be utterly dependent on the new government that's in. And who knows what's going to happen? How exciting. <laughs> what we do know is that the policy team um, in the Department of Health have been disbanded. The civil servants have been disbanded. And there are no ministers working on LPS. So we, we know that the government aren't actually going to do anything with this. Interestingly and of note, there is no suggestion of a date of implementation. So unlike the care caps where they, they're suggesting for future dates, there is no date. So there is speculation as to whether we'll even see LPS at all. We do know that, for example, Labour voted against a lot of the amendments. So if we get a Labour government, will we see something different? The Welsh government want to prioritise dolls and want to make dolls a workable solution. Frustratingly, so much work has been done on LPS, so much work um, and some really good stuff. And there's lots of things about LPS that we have misgivings about, but there's some really good things. Um, they are going to publish the summary of the consultation of the codes of practice. We still don't know if they're going to implement the new MCA code of practice. We literally don't know. So kind of watch this space really. Um, obviously we're quite hopeful they will because we know the code of practice that we're working from is so very out of date it's unhelpful now. What we do know however 
is that we've still got huge backlogs of people who are deprived of their liberty. I don't know how many you've got in BCP, but we've still got well over a thousand people who are out there in hospitals and care homes deprived of their liberty and we haven't assessed them. So we simply do not know whether they are settled, unsettled, happy, whatever. I think, and I think it is probably widely thought, that our waiting lists now are going to come under increasing scrutiny. So Doles is with us. I think there's been a little bit of kind of tread in water. Now we've got Doles for the foreseeable future, we're going to have to think about those backlogs and we're going to have to have some plans. There's still 200,000 referrals a year for Doles, so that's a huge amount of people. Um, and they have slowed a little bit because of LPS. Sorry, Shirley. No, 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 that's LPS is not going to happen. And that was never in LPS. So in LPS, the, the, the idea that if you predicted somebody was going to say go for respite or somebody regular had regular hospital admissions, say for dialysis, you could write it into a care plan. It was not a portable passport that was going to go around with the person. It was never that. Um, and that's not the case now. So we are we are well and truly stuck with dolls as is. Um, obviously, we've seen a little slowing referrals, but that could have been about LPS. But the national black backlog is thought to be 124,215 cases at year end 2022. So that's an eye-watering amount of people. And all of that stuff that we've talked about today, about people being deprived of their liberty, that's, that's a lot of people who may or may not be getting the care that, and treatment they, they want. Um, as a bit of an aside, we're quite excited because we started get into our waiting list and working through some of our long-standing people and really sadly we've assessed somebody who'd been in a care home for 11 years who's now palliative and end of life who said I've been unhappy for 11 years I've not wanted them. how awful how awful and, and there will be others out there so just a little reminder to ourselves as if we don't need reminding how important dolls are for local authorities, we risk financial and reputational damage if we get it wrong. So Haringey Council damages of £143,000 for failure to authorise a deprivation in a care home. There was evidence if there are alternatives available at the assessment um, that could have been completed at an earlier stage. The person was placed in a care home in 2008 because of concerns about her welfare. She was there till 2016 before being moved to a nursing home where she was then made subject to a deprivation of liberty. So she'd been, the reason this really cropped up is because of she was self-funding and there was outstanding care fees. Um, but the, the litigation friend claimed that the local authority had not taken steps to authorise the deprivation of liberty. They hadn't considered any alternatives for her. So £143,000 for Haringey and say a significant amount of reputational damage. And then you'll all remember Fluffy the cat. Who does not remember Fluffy the cat? So this case, this is a 2015 case. We've talked about it in training so many times. So I won't go into the real ins and outs, but this was the ex-RAF gunner who was removed from his property early one morning because the social worker told him that if he didn't go, they'd call the police. He wasn't even properly dressed when he was removed from his property. He was separated from Fluffy the cat. There were all sorts of concerns about him, but a lot of them were safeguarding concerns about the actions of other people and less about him. Um, and, and Essex County Council um, were award, had to award £60,000 in compensation and also repay care home fees. And we all remember Essex County Council for their failures. So, coming back to Dole's Department of Health and Social Care, say they will publish a summary of consultation. We don't know what that means. So, the MCA code will stand without LPS. We don't know. So, Welsh Government is already looking at improving Dole's. So, for us, we need to think about causing no harm. 
and nobody intentionally wants to cause anyone any harm but our system is loaded against us but we need to make sure if possible we're causing no harm we need to think about our triage and protocols so some of this will be sort of for esther and us to kind of think about but how can we triage because re realistically we're not going to assess between now and next year over a thousand people so how can we triage how can we be sure we've not got that poor chap sat there being miserable for 11 years how can we ensure that we do it better and what we do know is the ombudsman has said that where councils have got it wrong the lack of resources is not a good enough excuse which is um as you say i've had this conversation with esther the ombudsman had to say that didn't they but um so we need clear, clear screening tools um and we need to have robust justifications if we don't assess someone. So why are we not assessing people? So the Ombudsman, say so they, they, Cheshire East Council, they, um, they were criticised because they had said that they weren't going to, um, hang on, this is the wrong one, isn't it? This is a chap who didn't have a declaration of liberty for 11, 11 months. Um, interestingly, they didn't think there was any alternatives. He probably went in the same place, but they still criticised Cheshire East Council for not authorising the doles. And then Staffordshire Council made a decision that they would not assess people of low and medium priority. So they made it a kind of a policy decision. Rookie error. So we will never say we won't assess someone. We will never say that. We will endeavour to assess absolutely everyone. And we have got, I don't know about Esther's team, I'm pretty sure that's probably the case. We've got quite a low threshold. So if you phone us up and say, I'm really worried about Mrs. Smith in X care home, we're going to go out and see her. We're going to take it from you. We're going to take that from care home managers. We're going to take that from relatives that we've got, a, if there's a concern. We're never going to say, say we're not going to assess people that are seemingly low priority. So we have to be really careful with our language. So it's um, community dolls. Um, we're, we're all doing badly with community dolls. There's, across the country, there's so few authorised community dolls. And we do know that the REX procedure, the slimline procedure for authorising community dolls, I really tempted to ask Claire Evely from the ICB for opinion of the REX procedure, but I don't want her to swear in public. It's not particularly slimlined, it's clunky. Maybe we'll get some steer on how that could be done better. But there's an estimation that there's only 50, 59,000 people in the community that are deprived of their liberty. So we're scratching the surface on those people. There are currently only 4,000 applications per year. Dorset had the highest number in the county, but we still had a, a paltry number. But there's no legal aid available. So if there's any objections, then there's no automatic recourse to public funds. So if somebody has any assets, they're going to have to pay for their own legal costs. That's been raised. It's really unfair at the moment. Local authorities have probably let this group of people slip through the net. I think we all thought LPS is coming. It's going to sort this out. LPS is not coming. So we need to know who they are, where they are, where they're living, what restrictions are in place. Are they necessary and proportionate? Can their care arrangements be be amended so they are not deprived of their liberty? Is there any way we can do that? So we've got a lot of work to do as local authorities in terms of getting on top of those community dolls. Um, it's not a Dorset problem, it's a national problem. 16 and 17 year olds, what can I say? Um, we know, we know now that 16 and 17 year olds cannot have their deprivations of liberty authorised by anyone other than the Court of Protection. It's estimated that 6,616 17 year olds are deprived of their liberty with no authorisation in place. I thought that number's quite low. Well, it feels low to me. So they need to be identified and authorised using the National Dolls Court or the Court of Protection. And again, like the adults, there is no legal aid in place for those. So obviously a lot of 16, 17 year olds probably don't have assets in their own rights, but there might be some. So our colleagues from children's services can't turn around and say, great, LPS is not coming. We're out the room, guys, because they're firmly in the room with us on this one. So I have to say from my point of view, and I'm going to, own, this is a Dorset issue. I'm not, I'm not going to include Esther and BCP in this. 
I want to look at anything that we can to make dolls easier, lighter, dolls light. I don't think for me anything is off the table. So having gone through all of the things that we think are really important in the assessments, is there stuff we can cut out? We know there's lots of repetition. You know there's lots of repetition. Are there things that can be said using checklists, bullet points, don't need to write war and peace? We, we need to think, I, I'm trying to think and going to talk with the team about how we can kind of come up with a doll's light option, particularly when we've already assessed someone and we've got a, a big report that's, that's agreed, we know their background, we, 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 instead of reinventing the wheel each time, can we start at last year rather than reinventing the wheel? Um, can, what can we chop down, rationalise? What's mandatory? There's actually not that much in the guidance that's mandatory. The forms aren't mandatory. So we're going to look at that. And I was just wondering what your thoughts are, really. Shirley. Well, we, I, I think that's, you should say, what I'm saying is nothing's changing for now. So please don't take anything that I'm saying as, as something that's changing. So I think we're going to look at what, what we can carry over, what we need to redo. Personally, I think the best interest decision you need to revisit, I would, I would say for that year, is that placement or where that person's living? Is it still in their best interest? Is the care plan still meeting their needs? I don't think personally I wouldn't want to chop that bit out, but there's other bits that I can think of that I might think we could chop out. I don't know. But if we've got this number of people on our waiting list, and I, I'm guessing, I'm, you know, I'm no expert, but I don't think we're going to get many more resources that are thrown into this. We're the people that are going to have to make this work. Um, so I, I, I think that we're going to have to be creative. Um, and to say, I've got no ideas, no, well, I've got lots of ideas, nothing set in stone. Um, but the key message is, Dolls is with us and Dolls is with us for the foreseeable future. Um, and then obviously, as soon as we hear anything else, we'll let you know. Um, but LPS is off the table. Just really quickly, I, well, I was going to say, we had Lynn Romeo, um, Chief Social Worker to Dorset last week. And when I said LPS is off the table and may never happen, she pulled a very interesting face and said, oh, oh, I don't think we can say that. So who knows? Esther. Just think about anybody that you work with, spread the news within your team. If you are aware of anybody who's unhappy with their lot, please let the dog team know. Yeah. We had somebody who'd been in care for three years, we thought everything was fine, we assessed them last year. The community team had been working with them, there were loads of professionals coming in that were really feeling very unhappy, but nobody had told us. Mm -hmm. So we didn't prioritise him, and now we have, and I think that's going through the protection process. So please. <coughs> Don't be afraid to let us know. No, 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 no. We, we can make a few for 
And likewise with that chap, he was reviewed several times and we actually went back and looked at those reviews and who did them. There was a high proportion of staff who weren't qualified. So actually what it's made us think is in this room, we have got so much expertise. You, you all know what you're doing. You all think about dolls. You're all assessors. Have we spread the word widely enough? Because it kind of feels like maybe we haven't. And we need to, for us in Dorset, we need to think about our kind of unqualified workforce and give them some checklists and tips and things to help them too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. I know. I think the problem is, and we have this conversation in our team all the time, that behaviour becomes normalised, doesn't it? You see it in hospitals, you see it in care homes and nursing homes. So people exhibit behaviour that if you saw in the street or in a shop or on a bus, you would go, oh my goodness, what is wrong with this person? We need to help them. There's something going on here that's not okay. But if that's somebody in a care home who's wandering around with their bags packed saying, I need to get home to mummy, and they're in their 90s, they go, oh yeah, but it's just Maisie. She just always does that. She'll settle down soon. That's not okay, is it? I, I think we need to, you know, we understandably people become a little bit desensitized within those settings and and it's our job to kind of challenge that because some of the ways that people who who are already diminished through their illnesses their their, their mental disorders their lack of capacity they can't always communicate in an articulate way so they communicate in other ways and we've got to be really alert to that and we need to try and encourage some of our our care homes and hospitals to notice that as well so we've started to lose people. You're probably parking running out. Um, thank you so much. Um, um, we will. How are we going to get feedback, Rhiannon? Oh, there was a QR code on there. We've got. <laughs> I think we've got most people's, but those of you who haven't signed in, then we'll email you for um, feedback. Sorry, this is the first time we've done face-to-face -face training in such a long time. We've forgotten a few things. Sorry, one. Well... Yeah, yeah. What we're doing, we're filming. So say we're just practicing for a sort of a hybrid event to see if it will work on conference. But we we will also make sure that you get the slides. You may or may not see the film, depending on how cringeworthy it is. <laughs> Look, thank you so much. We've really, really appreciated. It. It's been fantastic, and how lovely to see you all.